Have you ever considered why most people say saving the first $100,000 is really the most difficult thing? This is because there are a lot of behaviors and a lot of habits that are tied behind saving that first $100,000. But when you do get to that point, it is the this stage and really the step towards a million dollars. When you start thinking of compounding interest and when you look at the ability to really save that amount of money, that is the point of, and you might be asking yourself, Reaching a million dollars in 2024 doesn't quite have the same impact than we've seen years ago. That is because of the Federal Reserve and looking at the inflation calculation, a million dollars today, even thinking back 20 years ago, would only be almost half a million dollars that you would have to have to hit that exact same status. However, when you start looking at seven figures in a bank account, it's not gonna hurt and it is an honestly a game changer. Even from my perspective, as we get over a net you're worth millionaire, it makes a big difference. And there's some simple ways that I'm gonna share with you in this video today to get there. Starting with number one, sticking to a budget. Now, as a financial counselor, as a net worth millionaire, sticking to a budget is really the classic. It, it, it is the staple. Getting a budget, getting a spending plan, getting whatever you wanna call it. You have to know exactly where your money is going, how much money you have, where your money is going, what you have left over. That really makes an informed decision on what you can do with your money. It also gives you a very transparent blueprint of where you can cut expenses. This, of course, for me, was really eye-opening when it came to subscription services, when it came to cable internet services, looking at all of the things that I could shop around for, including auto insurance, to save some money. By saving some money on those expenses, it gave me a lot more money to invest. Now, of course, really figuring out how much money you take home, then of course, breaking it down into really the main parts, which are the necessities. These are the things, when you start looking at a budget, these are rent, it's groceries, utilities, and then what are the things that are kind of falling in the needs and wants category? What are the wants? What are the nice to have? What are the things that you could get cheaper at different places and save exponentially money? This, of course, is going to paint a very clear picture of what falls into the needs, what falls into the wants, and exactly what you have left over. Now, for a majority of people, this doesn't mean that it, you know you can't do anything fun. I, I don't like the point where like Dave Ramsey says, you're on beans and rice, you're not doing anything. There are a ton of different budget strategies, the 50, 30, 20, the 80, 20. I personally do zero-based budgeting, meaning that every single dollar, every single month is used in its entirety and I budget to a zero. Now, the way that I do that in the methodology is because I have my paycheck, I have my expenses, I have everything that is left over. The portion that is left over is what I use as investable assets, meaning that the less, again, the more money that I make, let's say through YouTube, just like we're doing here with the channel, the less expenses where I can cut down or eliminate some expenses, gives me that third bucket that I have to invest in the bigger pile that I have to invest, the faster I can reach that financial goal and the faster I can reach that million dollars. Now, of course, I couple this with low cost index funds, my ETFs. If you followed the channel for a while, ETFs are honestly where it's at. I used to invest in stocks. I used to kind of chase the rabbit where, hey, this stock is you know a hot tip. We're gonna go ahead and invest here. I used to day trade a little bit. Didn't work out very well, even looking at stocks. A lot of times I lost money. When I started getting into low cost index funds, when I started looking at ETFs in their entirety, this is the point of my life where I built wealth and where I built wealth very, very fast. Looking at a lot of the large cap, the mid cap, looking at the small cap, looking at the S&P 500 index fund, which of course is the VOO, the Vanguard S&P 500, but even looking at the Vanguard total index, the VTI, if you're putting it in those, you are investing into everything that America has to offer. One of course is just based on large cap, one is it based on everything in the US, which of course for businesses have been doing incredibly well. Now this of course feeds into compound interest. When you start hitting this $100,000, it is really the springboard to the compound interest that you need. So when you think of getting that 100,000 mark, that is where again, you can start feeling the effect of dividends, you can feel the effect of growth, and you'll see your balances going up exponentially. Even if you're not putting anything in it, even for me personally, I hit the 100,000 mark after about two months. I was at about 112,000. So looking back in about the last, I would say 60 to 90 days, it has grown exponentially. 
and I got almost $1,500 last year in dividends, but the exponential growth that we're seeing within these low cost index funds has been kind of crazy. And of course, I do dollar cost averaging, like I said in the scenario earlier, with that last bucket that I have of the investable assets, I put that into the market every two weeks like clockwork and really just churning it. So not only am I seeing the growth potential that I'm having with this compounding interest, but I'm also making regular contributions in there, which is really just springboarding it to that million dollar mark. Now, of course, a lot of this comes with tax management strategies, doing, doing it yourself and really looking at the tax advantage to doing TurboTax, you know, doing your taxes yourself, guys. For a lot of people, it is very something that I feel they overlook. For me personally, I hired a tax accountant, which is kind of crazy because I am paying a certified um, a tax accountant, my CPA. I am paying him on a yearly basis to do my taxes. People that are using TurboTax and that are using H&R Block are paying the same amount for taxes for the tax preparation fee that I'm seeing with my um, CPA. However, the CPA is doing a ton more work with the personal accountant and he is also doing a lot more work when it comes to the tax planning, when we're looking at different strategies, when you look at the efficiency of really coming up with a financial strategy with taxes in mind, it is huge. This is one of the reasons why I always say, when it comes to a 401k plan, it should be in a Roth. When it comes to the IRAs, they should be in a Roth. When it comes to HSAs, you need to be maxing that out. All of those are going to give you exponentially the HSA, a tax advantage now. The Roth is gonna allow you to pay taxes up front. But when you start getting further into your life, when you get to needing the money that is in the 401k and those Roth accounts, you're not gonna have to pay taxes, which is going to be a super smart tax management strategy because later on in life, when you get the compounding interest, when you start looking at the one, two, three million dollar accounts, when they're in a Roth, the taxes are paid, the compounding interest is taking effect. You could even pull 50,000, 80,000, 100,000 dollars out of those higher balance accounts every single year with the growth factor you have in there, with the compounding interest, you are still gonna be making money in those accounts, even though you're pulling money out to supplement Social Security, which is kind of crazy. And of course, when we talk about compounding interest, it works in the reverse. We talk about debts. When you look at credit card debt, it is devastating. It is absolutely crushing America. We're at $1.13 trillion. Now, according to Forbes in June of 24, average credit card interest rate is 27.65%. That is right, guys, you are paying almost 28%. Now, when you think of a stock market you know, investment, when you think of the S&P 500, if it's yielding a 10% return, you're paying 27% on your credit card. When you look at literally anything, it, it's kind of insane to think when you start getting into the annual percentage rates that are that high, you are never going to get out of debt unless you are turning an absolute ton of money into that, cutting your expenses anywhere you can, pumping everything into those credit card debts, doing consolidations, doing balance transfers, but paying off and eliminating this debt because it's kind of crazy. For an example, a $10,000 balance at 25%, could turn into more than $16,800. So on a $10,000 balance, making the minimum payment, you're gonna pay $7,000 in interest over a $10,000 balance, which again is just kind of asinine because that $7,000 you could be investing elsewhere. That is money literally that you're handing over to your financial institutions. When you think of Capital One, when you think of Discover, MasterCard, they are charging you an absorbent amount of, of, of um, interest on those. And then the final one we look at is additional streams of income, just like YouTube. And if you like the content I'm putting out, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. Finding additional streams of income is going to propel you to pay that debt off or build that investment account much, much faster. When you look at the ability to have side hustles, as of 2023, 51% of Americans have a side hustle, even earners that have more than $100,000 per year from their job. They're very, very diversified when it comes to the income. For me, I was kind of thinking of this is I have my regular nine to five, which of course is a good stream of income. I have my YouTube channels, which as of now, we have three YouTube channels, two gaming channels. That is another stream of income. I am getting dividends on the investments that I have. That is another stream of income. I am getting interest out of CDs that I have in my financial institution. I am also yielding 5% back in interest on my um, high yield savings that I have with M1 Finance. So when you start thinking of the overall picture 
I have five streams of income right there from multiple sources, meaning that even if something should happen to my primary source of income, my job, my regular nine to five, I still have the ability to supplement a lot of the income from other streams. In addition to that, not only freeing up a lot of time is with the additional income streams because we do not carry any debt means that the money from the additional income streams can actually supplement what we have for expenses for a insane amount of time, probably forever, um, if we really buckle down to the expenses. But overall, you can see where additional streams of income make a big difference. That way, if there ever is a chance that we are unemployed, we still have different sources of income, including the emergency fund that we can truly use as an emergency. So all right, guys, so that is gonna do it for today's video. Let me know in the comments what you guys think, and as always, thank you guys for watching.